This class is Derivative Securities. My name is Kirby Arkundiv. I have a PhD from the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign. I'm a chartered financial analyst and a certified financial planner. In this video, we will discuss swaps using the PowerPoints from the excellent text Options, Futures, and Other Derivatives by John C. Hall. What is a swap? A swap is an agreement to exchange cash flows at a specified future time according to specified rules. An example of a plain vanilla interest rate swap would be an agreement by Apple to receive six-month LIBOR, or today possibly SOFR, and pay a fixed rate of 3% per annum every six months for three years on a notional principle of $100 million. Here is an example of those cash flows. All of the fixed rate side cash flows would be 3% times 100 million divided by 2 are $1.5 million. The floating rate cash flows are determined by the LIBOR rate six months before the payment takes place. So if a payment is going to be taking place on September 8th, 2016, that payment would be the LIBOR rate six months before that on March 8th, 2016 of 2.2% times 100 million divided by two or $1.1 million. The next payment to take place on March 8th of 2017 would be based on LIBOR six months before that, or on September 8th, 2016, of 2.8 percent times 100 million divided by two, or 1.4 million dollars. The net payment in each of these six-month time periods would be the difference between the floating rate cash flow payment, in this case 1.1 million, minus the fixed rate cash flow payment of 1.5 million giving a net cash flow of negative $400,000. For the next one, 1.4 minus 1.5 are $100,000. For the next one, 1.65 minus 1.50. So now you have a positive $150,000, etc. cetera, for all of the payments um, associated with the swap. What are the uses for a swap? Well, you could want to convert a liability from a fixed rate to a floating rate, or from a floating rate to a fixed rate. Alternatively, you could convert an asset or an investment from a fixed rate to a floating rate, or from a floating rate to a fixed rate. Here would be an example of a swap agreement between Citibank and Apple, where Apple receives the London Interbank Offer Rate, LIBOR, and pays out a fixed rate of 3%. They might use this, Apple, to transform a liability from a floating rate to a fixed rate. So let's say Apple has a liability that it has to pay out a floating rate of LIBOR plus 0.1%. It does the swap with Citibank. Now you can see the LIBOR is basically a pass-through. You can take LIBOR minus LIBOR. And now Apple has a fixed rate liability of 3% plus 0.1% or 3.1%. Here is a, another example of a swap, in this case between Citigroup and Intel, where Intel agrees to pay LIBOR to Citigroup and receive 2.97%. In this example, Intel is going to be converting a liability from a fixed rate to a floating rate. Initially, they have a liability of 3.2%. They engage in the swap, and now they end up with a floating rate liability 
of LIBOR plus 3.2 minus 2.97 R of 1.17%. Here we have Apple transforming an asset from a fixed to a floating rate. So this is an asset that initially paid Apple 2.1%. Now they engage in this swap with Citigroup, paying out 3% and receiving LIBOR. So now they go from a fixed rate asset to now having an asset that pays LIBOR plus 3 minus 2.7, or LIBOR plus 0.3. Yet another example, Intel transforming an asset from floating to fixed. Intel initially is receiving a payment of LIBOR minus 0.2%. They engage in this swap with Citigroup. The LIBORs cancel out, and now they receive an asset that is fixed of 2.97 minus 0.2 or 2.77% fixed rate. How are swaps quoted? Well, here is an example of a list of swap quotes. Maturity is two years up to 10 years. And we have a bid rate of 2.55 an ask rate of 2.58, and the swap quote is an average of those two of 2.565. And in this case, you have, it appears, a increasing interest rate environment. What kind of a day count convention do swaps use? Well, it's specified for fixed and floating rate payments, so the swaps vary from one to another. Uh, for example, LIBOR is likely to be actual, meaning the actual number of days, which could be 365 or 366 in a leap year, divided by 360 in the United States, because LIBOR is a money market rate, and this is how money markets are quoted. How are swap agreements confirmed? Confirmation specified the terms of a transaction. The international swaps and derivatives has developed master agreements that can be used to cover all agreements between two counterparties. And central counterparty clearing houses are used for most standard swaps between two financial institutions. Why would people engage in swaps? Well, one of the main arguments is the comparative advantage argument. Let's say we have two corporations, AAA and BBB, and if they look into the market, they get the following offers. If AAA corporation borrows fixed rate, it gets 4%. If it borrows floating rate, it gets six-month LIBOR minus 0.1%. TBBB corporation, if it goes to the fixed rate market, it gets 5.2%. If it goes to the floating rate market, it gets six month LIBOR plus 0.6%. Well, if AAA wants to borrow floating, it gets this. Triple B wants to borrow fixed, it gets this. But there could arise a situation where rather than AAA going directly to the floating market, they instead go to the fixed rate market, engage in a floating for fixed rate swap with triple B and end up with a better deal than they would have got initially. Same with B. So let's look at an example of how this might arise. So again, we have a situation where triple A Corp would prefer to borrow floating and the floating rate they could get directly in the market is LIBOR minus 0.1%. Triple B Corp would prefer to borrow fixed. In the fixed rate market, they would have to borrow at 5.2%. Let's see what happens if instead Triple A Corp 
borrows at 4% in the fixed rate market and engages in this swap. And Triple B Corp borrows at LIBOR plus 0.26% and engages in this swap. So Triple A Corp starts with 4% but then they receive 4.35% and pay out LIBOR. So their net loan cost is going to be LIBOR plus four minus 4.35, our LIBOR minus 0.35%. And that's a better deal than they would have got directly in the floating rate market of LIBOR minus 0.1%. Triple B Corp starts with a floating rate of LIBOR plus 0.6, receives LIBOR and pays out 4.35%. The LIBORs cancel and they end up paying 4.35% plus 0.6% are 4.95%, which is also a better deal than they would have got going directly into the fixed rate market. So both AAA Corp and Triple B Corp are better off with this swap agreement. What about if a financial institution is involved? Well, banks don't do things for free, so they're going to take a little bit of a cut of any swap agreement that they negotiate. In this example, between AAA and Triple B, they're passing through LIBOR, but the fixed rate side of 4.37% that comes from triple B only goes out to triple A at 4.33%. So the financial institution gets the difference between these two are 0.04%. Does the comparative advantage argument always work? Well, there are problems with it, but certainly organizations do engage in a lot of swaps. One of the problems is, in this example, the 4% and the 5.2% rates available to AAA and B Corp are fixed rate market and five-year rates, whereas the LIBOR rates of LIBOR minus 0.1% and LIBOR plus 0.6% are available in the floating rate market, and those are six-month rates, so they can change. And the LIBOR rate may pass through but the spread between LIBOR or spread above or below LIBOR that these institutions pay can change every six months depending on borrowing conditions um, and how good of a credit rating these two different organizations have. How do you value an interest rate swap? Well, initially when the companies sign a swap, they're close to being worthless. Um, they lower risk to both parties, but they one party isn't paying the other a set amount of money in most cases. At later dates, on the other hand, as interest rates change, uh, swaps can become more valuable to one side and the other, and they can be valued as a portfolio of forward rate agreements. So the procedure for doing this is to calculate LIBOR forward rates calculate the swap cash flows that will occur if LIBOR forward rates are realized, and then discount these swap cash flow rates at the overnight index swap rate. We will proceed with an example of this. Let's consider a swap that involves paying 3% per annum and receiving LIBOR every six months at a $100 million principal. The swap has 15 months remaining exchanges in three, nine, and 15 months still will need to take place. The LIBOR rate applicable to exchanges in three months was determined three months ago and is 2.9%. The forward LIBOR rates for the time period of between three and nine months and nine and 15 months are 3.429% and 3.734% respectively. The overnight index swap zero rates for maturities of three, nine, and 15 months are 2.8%, 3.2%, and 3.4%, respectively. Now let's see what happens. So now we will calculate the value of this fixed 
for floating exchange swap. We have payments in three months, nine months, and 15 months. So three months is one-fourth of the year. Nine months is three-fourths, or 0.75% of a year. And 15 months is one year and three months, or 1.25 years. The fixed side payment was 3% of the $100 million notional principal. 3% of a million is 3 million divided by 2 because it's a payment every six months. It gives us a payment of $1.5 million every six months. The last floating ring payment was determined by the last LIBOR rate of 2.9%. So the floating rate payment will be 2.9% times 100 million divided by two, or $1.45 million. The next LIBOR rate is estimated to be 3.429%. So the payment in 0.75 years will be 3.429% or 0 0.03429 times 100 divided by two, are $1.7145 million, and the payment in 15 months, or 1.25 years, will be 0.03734 times 100 million divided by two, or $1.8672 million. So the net payments are the sum of these two, negative 1.5 plus positive 1.45 gives us negative 0.05 million dollars, or $50,000. Negative 1.5 plus 1.7145 gives us a positive 0.2145, or $214,500. And 1.8672 minus 1.5 gives us $367,200. So these cash flows take place in 0.25 years, three-fourths of a year, and 1.25 years. So we have to discount these cash flows by the OIS rate. The three-month OIS rate is 2.8%. The nine-month OIS rate is 3.2% and the 15-month OIRS rate is 3.4%. To get our discount factor, we're using continuous compounding. So present value equals future value exponent to the minus rate times time. So we have exponent minus 0.028 times a quarter gives us the discount factor of 0.993 for three months. 32 times 0.75 exponent negative gives us 0 0.9763 for nine months, and exponent negative 0 0.034 times 1.25 gives us 0 0.9584 for 15 months. So the present value of the first cash flow will be this negative 0 0.05 times the 0.993 gives us this number here, our 49,700 negative. The next one, this number times this number, gives us 209,400. And the third cash flow, this number times this number, gives us the present value of the third cash flow as 351,900. Then we sum all of three of these, and get this number here, our $511,700, our $0.5117 million as the current present value on the swap. And of course, initially when it was signed, it would have been worth zero. And now, of course, it is no longer zero. Another topic that can come up is bootstrapping of LIBOR forward rates. To see an example of how you could do this, and I have another video on bootstrapping that you can certainly watch, 
but in this example we will say 6, 12, 18, and 24 month overnight index swap rates are 3.8%, 4.3%, 4.6%, .4 and 4.75% respectively with continuous compounding. Six month LIBOR rate is 4% semi-annual compounding. Suppose the forward LIBOR rates for 6 to 12 months and 12 to 18 months have already been calculated at 5% and 5.5% respectively using semi-annual compounding. The two-year swap rate is 5%. The next step then would be to calculate the LIBOR forward rate for the 18 to 24 month period. And you do this by saying, well, an initial swap when it's signed is worth zero. So therefore, we could set a swap value equal to zero and calculate that forward rate. OK. So initially, we say we have a two-year swap where 5% is paid and LIBOR is received on $100 million. And it's initially going to be worth zero. So we need to sum up a total of four payments. So a two-year swap with a payment every six months is four payments. And the sum present value thereof of all those payments has to equal zero. So what's the present value of the first payment? Well, one half because it's six months. And then the LIBOR rate is 0.04 minus 0.05, which will be the same for all of them because that's the 5% fixed rate on the swap times 100 for a $100 million notional principal. And then we have exponent to minus the OIS six month rate times 0.5 because it's six months. So this is the present value of the payment in six months. So all of these will be 0.5 because these are payments every six months. All of the fixed rate payments are 0.05. Here we have the LIBOR rates given, 0.04 in six months, 0.05 in a year, 0.055 in a year and a half, times $100 million for the notional principal. The first one occurs in six months, the next one in a year, the next one in 1.5 years. And here are the OIS rates, 0.038, minus 0 0.043 and minus 0 0.046. So we sum up these and then we figure out, well, the fourth payment has to be the sum of all of these with a negative sign in front of it because the total value of the swap has to be zero. So if I sum these two up, I get 49, 23, I get the sum of these two as negative point 2573. Therefore, the fourth payment has to be worth positive 0.2573. So the total value of the swap is zero. So the final payment would have to be valued like this. We have 0.5. Then what we're trying to find right here is this forward LIBOR rate F minus 0.05, because that's the only fixed rate, times 100 million notional. And then we were given that the OIS rate for two years from now is 0.0475. So the sum of this calculation here has to equal the 0.2573. We can simplify this and then say, well, what's 100 million times e to the negative 0.0475, the second power, times one half? Well, that equals 45.47. So F minus 0.05 times this equals this. Now we just solve for F. So we take the 0.2573 divided by 45.47. We add the 0.05 to it. And then we get the LIBOR rate, the forward rate, in two years. That would be two years right here has to equal 0.05566 or 5.566%.
So far, we have looked at fixed for floating interest rate swaps in a given currency, dollars. Another type of commonly used swap is going to be a fixed for fixed currency swap. So you are swapping, in this example, British pounds for US dollars. So we have a five-year agreement by BP, British Petroleum, to pay 3% on a US dollar principle of $15 million and receive 4% on a sterling principle of 10 million pounds. And these would be used, for example, to eliminate currency risk, or at least currency exchange rate risk. Unlike a fixed for floating swap, a currency swap generally involves an exchange of principal. So an interest rate swap, the principal is not exchanged. The $100 million notional is not exchanged. Why would you give $100 million for $100 million? But in a currency swap, the principal is exchanged at the beginning and end of the swap, since you're in different currencies. Let's look at the cash flows from the swap. Initially, $15 million is exchanged for 10 million pounds. And then in six months, 450,000 dollars are 3% times the 15 million is exchanged for 400,000 pounds are 10,000 pounds times 4%. And each of the following six months, you get the same exchange of $450,000 for 400,000 pounds. And then at the expiration of the swap, the $15 million is exchanged back for the 10 million pounds, plus another exchange of $450,000 for 400,000 pounds. Why would you use a currency swap? Well, same kind of uses that you had for an interest rate swap. You use it to convert a liability in one currency to a liability in another currency, or to convert an investment in one currency to an investment in another currency. And you can imagine a lot of companies who are having their home office in one country in one currency and a bunch of factories operating in another country in another currency and something like this could certainly be used to lower their risk. Canberra Advantage may very well be real in this case because of not only taxes but also um, currency rules, um, things of that sort. So we can look for example, General Electric wants to borrow in Australian dollars, AUD, Qantas wants to borrow in U.S. dollars, borrowing cost after adjusting for the differential impact of taxes. Each company has to pay taxes in each country uh, based on the tax code of that country. So we would have U.S. dollars 5% for General Electric, 7.6% in AUD for General Electric, Qantas on the other hand, 7% in U.S. dollars and 8% borrowing costs in AUD. How would you value a fixed for fixed currency swap? Um, you can value them in two different ways. So fixed for fixed currency swaps can be valued either as a series of forward rate agreements as we did with fixed for floating swaps, or you can also do them as a difference between two bonds. And here is an example. All Japanese interest rates are 1.5% per annum with continuous compounding. All US dollar interest rates are 2.5% per annum, also with continuous compounding. We will say 3% is received in yen and 4% is paid in dollars. Payments are made annually. 
principles are ten million dollars and um, one billion two hundred million yen. The swap will last for three more years. Currently, exchange rate is one hundred and ten yen per dollar. The first thing we need to do is calculate forward rates. The forward rate in dollars per yen equals the spot rate in dollars per yen times using continuous compounding the exponent of the risk-free rate in dollars times time over the exponent of the risk-free rate in yen times time such that whichever currency is being printed the most in a free market will have the highest interest rate um, for a risk-free rate R nominal equals R real plus the inflation rate. Therefore, whichever currency has the highest interest rate will depreciate the most into the future, and therefore in the future we will take in this example if the U.S. had a higher interest rate or dollars to buy a yen. This formula can be written as spot rate in dollars per yen times exponent of R dollars minus R yen times T. So for one year, forward rate in dollars per yen, the current spot rate is one dollar for 110 yen, the interest rate in dollars is 2.5%. The interest rate in yen is 1.5%. This interest rate minus this interest rate is just 1%. So our future in one year, or our forward in one year, is $1 per 110 yen, exponent of 1% times 1, or 0 0.009182. For the two-year forward rate, you just replace this 1 with a 2, and you get 1 over 110 exponent of 1 times 2, or 0 0.009275. So in one year, it's going to take fewer dollars to buy a yen than in two years, and then in three years, you put a 3 in here, and we get 0 0.09368. So in three years, it takes more dollars to buy a yen than in two years or one year, and that's because the interest rate in dollars is higher than the interest rate in yen. Now we can value the swap in terms of forward rates. So we have cash flows occurring in one year, two years, and three years. The dollar cash flows are 4% times $10 million, are $400,000 in year one and year two, in year three, you get another payment of 400000 plus your $10 million principles back. The yen cash flows are 3% of $1,200,000,000, are $36 million in year one and year two. In the final year, you get $36 million, plus you pay back the $1.2 billion yen. We calculated the forward rates in the last slide. To get the dollar value of the yen cash flows, we take the yen cash flow times the forward rate, converting it here, and we get $0.13306 million. For year two, we get 36 times the $0.009275, and we get $0.3339 million. And in the final year, we get one billion two hundred and thirty-six million times point zero nine three six eight, or eleven point five seven eight six million dollars. To get the net cash flow, we take this number minus this number. In the first year, we get negative point zero six nine four. In the second year, we take point three 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 nine minus point four. We get negative zero point zero six six one. And the final year, we get $11.5786 million minus $10.4 million for a positive $1.1786 million. The final step is to find the present value of these three cash flows. We are told that the interest rate in dollars is 2.5%. So in the first year, we find the present value equals future value exponent of nine minus 0 0.025 times 1, in the second year, 25 times 2, and in the third year, 25 times 3. So the first year, we take 
this number, negative 0 0.00694 times exponent of minus 0 0.025, and get negative 0 0.0677. Second year, this number, uh, negative 0 0.0661 exponent minus 0 0.025 times 2, are a negative 0 0.0629. The final year, present value, will be 1.1786, exponent negative 0 0.025 times 3, or 1,000,000.0934. Now we sum these up. This is a positive, both of these are negative, sum the three of them, and we get a positive 0.9629 million dollars is the current value of the swap. So we just showed how to value a currency swap in terms of forward rate agreements. You can also value them in terms of bonds. Either way, you should get the same result, as you will see down here. This is the same result as on the last slide. To value in terms of bonds, well, you have the same cash flows. So the cash flows for the dollar side of the swap in year one will be 0.4 million, year two, 0.4 million, and year three, 10.4 million. On the inside, it will be 36 million, 36 million in year two, and 1 billion, 236 million in year three. A bond is just the present value of all future cash flows. So now we will find the present value of the dollar cash flows in dollars, and then the present value of the yen cash flows in yen. The present value of the dollar cash flows will be 400,000 exponent negative. The interest rate in dollars is 2.5%. So this present value here is $390.1,000. The next year, you discount by two. So the present value of 0.4 million in year two is 0.3805 million. And the present value of 10.4 million in year three at the interest rate in dollars of 2.5% is $9.6485 million. We now sum these three numbers to get the present value of the bond in dollars is $10.419 million. The present value of the yen bond is 36 in one year at the yen interest rate of minus 0 0.015, which gives us 35.46, the yen interest rate is 1.5%. The next cash flow in yen, also 36 million, is discounted for two years, so the present value of that is 34.94 million yen, and then the final cash flow in yen of 1,236,000,000, discounted at 1.5% for three years, gives us this number here of 1,181.61 yen. Summing these three, this number plus this number plus this number, gives us the value of the yen bond of 1,252,000,000. To value the swap, you take the value of the yen bond convert using the spot rate to dollars. So this is the dollar value of the yen bond. Subtract off the dollar value of the dollar bond, and we get the net value of the swap is once again $0.9629 million. Um, this is the simplest kind of currency swap. That would be a fixed for fixed currency swap. There, of course, many other types of currency swaps, and as we will see, many other types of swaps. You could have a fixed for floating currency swap, which would be the equivalent of a fixed for fixed currency swap, plus adding a fixed for floating interest rate swap on one side. Floating for floating currency swap, equivalent to a fixed for fixed currency swap, and then two floating rate interest rate swaps, one on each currency. Um, a swap can be regarded as a convenient way of packaging forward contracts. You could just sign a bunch of forward contracts. It would basically be the same thing. And as when it is initially signed, it has zero value. But of course, over time, as we've shown in the last examples, the value to one counterparty in the swap becomes positive. The value to the other counterparty becomes negative, And therefore, you do have 
credit risk. So one party could potentially default. Uh, when de derivative transactions with a counterparty are cleared bilaterally, they are netted. There is exposure on one side versus the other. Some collateral is posted. But over time, swaps are not necessarily marked to market. So one side could potentially owe the other side a large amount of money. Another type of swap is a credit default swap. We'll take a very brief look at those. An example would be one with a notional principal, say $100 million and a maturity of five years. So the protection buyer pays a fixed rate, maybe 150 basis points on the notional principal, the credit default swap spread, and then if the reference entity, a country or company, defaults, protection seller buys bonds issued by the reference entity for their face value and the spread payments stop. So basically, you're buying um, insurance against a default. Uh, you keep paying for this insurance until the default takes place, and then the bonds go to the party that is selling you the insurance. So the total face value of the bonds bought equals the initial notional principle before the default takes place. This is a graph over time of the notional amounts outstanding in trillions of US dollars for a variety of the most common types of swaps. And you can see interest rate swaps up here are the most common. And the amount of trillions of dollars, $400 trillion, is utterly huge. Um, also on here we have in red FX swaps and in light blue currency swaps the difference is whether or not payments are made or the dollar amount of the swaps is just exchanged, whether the notional is just exchanged or whether payments are made every year or six months. In black we see credit default swaps also have a pretty good sized market and then down here also equity swaps and commodity swaps. So there's lots of different types of swaps in there beyond what we will discuss in this chapter. So other types of swaps, we have either amateurizing or step-up swaps. Um, one, the principal goes down over time, one it goes up. Compounding swaps, where the payments are not made, but they are just compounded over time. Constant maturity swaps, lobber and arrears swaps, curl swap, equity swap, cross-currency interest rate swap, floating for floating currency swap, differential swaps, commodity swaps, and variant swaps. But uh, these topics are beyond the scope of what we will discuss in this lecture. I thank you for watching this video.